here's the million dollar question. What behaviors that I'm seeing now in the classroom will translate into the workplace? So that's one of the things that we talk about when it comes to, well, we call it worksite wellness. That word is actually a transition now to worksite well-being. The idea is that now we're not only focused on wellness, which is like, you know, health from the neck down, but the well-being aspect means we're now talking about health from the neck up and how important our mental health is. But here's the thing. And I hope you're sitting down because I also have live human beings who are in my classroom. Here's what happened. Obviously, during COVID, everybody went online and and we did that for a number of years. In fact, UNCG and our Department of Public Health actually went against the grain. So this is important. Our chancellor said, you know, everybody's back face to face because we wanted to have a show of good faith. We're taking all the precautions. But as epidemiologists, we said, well, it's not over. There's going to be an upswing when it gets cold. And we actually went against the grain and said, you know, don't come back to class. Uh, We had a slap on the wrist, but we actually minimized the infection rate. So we actually thought of the employees or our students first and kept them safe. Think long term. And this gets into where you and I were talking about also your initiative as well. What's that all about thinking long term? I'm literally ready to jump out of my seat. You're listening to. Welcome to What the Tech your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace. Welcome back to this episode with Rolando right over here on this side. Hey, don't forget me, Dave Kelly over here from Southern New Hampshire. Where are you today, Rolando? I think I'm still in the blue room in Loudoun County, Virginia (laughs) on, on a transitioning day from what I think is the end of summer to maybe fall. I don't know. The weather's been goofy the last couple of weeks. So I'm hoping that uh, it's solid fall from here on out. We officially turned the heat on for the first time this morning. My house got down to 63 degrees. Ooh. And um, I don't mind paying, make it 68 to 70 degrees. So yeah, we had to turn it on. It's official. Summer's over. Shame, mm. shame. I know. Football season's in full swing. I'm loving it. So, mm. and I'm also loving who we've got on today. I had the privilege, Dave, of chit-chatting with him before uh, he came on, uh, He's uh, before he's, his appearance today. Our good f- mutual friend, Steve Cadigan, put us together. And so I'm really appreciative. And I want to give big props to Steve Cadigan uh, for doing that, because Mike is a, not only a standout guy, but he's got a lot to say in what's really happening. I, mean, I, I don't know if behind the scenes would, would be the right word, but certainly an important topic as it relates to people that are working from home, remote work, the workplace, people's lives and how they're 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 rethinking how their lives are structured and he's got some really wonderful insights on on things that he's doing, uh, some research, um, some some data, some stats, and some an, an initiative that he has uh, with the future of our kids. So I'm really fascinated to jump into that discussion today. Same. All right. Well, let's not wait around. Let's bring. Well, before we bring him out, let me let me tell you. Let me let me formally introduce him, Dave. All right. Let me, let's do Doctor Mike Perko some justice. All right. So Doctor Mike Perko is an award winning educator, author professor. And he, in 2018, earned the the UNC System Board of Governance in Teaching Award. He's a professor at UNC Greensboro, known for his pioneering children's book, How to Eat, Leap, and Sleep Like a Superhero. I want to be one of those one of these days. And as an expert in wellness, Mike led Alabama's power acclaimed health promotion program. He created the survey to predict adolescent athlete dietary supplement use, which has been used around the world by researchers. Fascinating. I wish I'd have known that or had information on that when I was an athlete back in the day, Dave. And he wrote a book titled Taking One for the Team. Interesting, interesting title. And Mike has a passion for inspiring the future leaders with his initiative called 500 Fist Bumps. And we're looking to hear a lot more about that because it's fascinating what he's doing there. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Mike Perko. Oh, no. Oh, I hit the wrong one. That's not what I wanted. I didn't want to say, oh, no. I wanted to give you a clap. That's what happens when you push the wrong buttons, Mike. You hit the, oh, no. And when I should have hit the clap button. Yeah, you know, if, I, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a million times. You live by technology, you die by technology, right? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> oh, well, Mike, I really appreciate you coming on the show today because uh, you've got your finger on 
on the pulse on some things that just, you know, we may not even be aware of in how much impact something so simple. And I'm going to get to the 500 fist bumps because it's an amazing, fascinating initiative that you have going on. But, you know, professionally, you've, you've hung your hat on in the workplace. And this is the time, right? This is the time when those types of um, topics are coming way up, way below the surface and really being front and center these days. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I, I want to thank you for that introduction. Um, you know, uh, one of my friends said every introduction should be like you are Bruce Springsteen introducing the next inductee in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So thank you so much. I feel like I'm, I'm in the What the Tech Hall of Fame now. Yay. Uh, Yay. I love it. I love I, it. If I had a hat on, I'd, I'd take it off. <laughs> so uh, my hat's off. Uh, secondly, um, I, I begin every class, and I've done this. I, I've been a professor for 27 years, and I begin every class when I walk in by saying good morning, scholars, or good morning, colleagues. So um, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this panel. So um, good morning, scholars. Good morning, colleagues. We have a lot to talk about because we do live in amazing time. Indeed. Um, listen, uh, this is important. I want to make sure everybody's listening to this. So I have been a professor for 27 years, which means I have had five generations come through my classroom. I've taught over 5,000 students beginning in the 1990s, and I currently have the Gen Zs, who, as you know, um, uh, reach for their phone every five minutes or so. And that is totally fine. We, we involve technology into our classroom, not only because um, it is what it is, but because we want to, because this is all going to be part of the learning experience. Here's the, here's the million dollar question is what behaviors that I'm seeing now in the classroom will translate into the workplace, right? So that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we, we, we talk about when it comes to, well, we call it worksite wellness. That word is actually trans uh, transition now to worksite well-being, which is a mm -hmm. really, I mean, it may seem, seem like a simple thing. We've added a hyphen and, and the word uh, being after it, but the idea is that now we're not only focused on wellness, which is like, you know, health from the neck down, you know, how many steps am I getting and, and uh, you know, go to this couch to 5K program, sign up for that. But the well-being aspect means we're now talking about health from the neck up and how important our mental health is. And, and uh, you know, certainly that's above the fold. So I, I'm totally ready to dig in today to your questions about adults today in the workplace future adults in the workplace. And, you know, the amazing thing about what we're going to talk about today is the kids who are around today, when they become the adults in the workplace, it is going to be fascinating. Indeed. No okay. doubt. And I, and I want to jump into that, including all the, you said you were going to show us some data. I mean, I'm a nerd on the data side and I can't wait to hear all of that. But I think Dave, before we jump into the data, you got a little something for us? Yeah, so we have some questions, of course, talking about, you know, the children and the future workforce. But first, are you a small to medium sized business owner eager to up your communication game? Well, listen, Global Tech Worldwide is your secret weapon. They specialize in hands free communication devices like headsets, speakerphones and cutting edge video communication devices and cameras. But here's the kicker. They're not just about hardware. They are your go-to negotiation partner for voice hardware and services, making your transition to advanced communication platforms a tactical masterpiece. Global Tech knows the tech battlefield inside and out. They're not here to just push you products. They're here to decode your unique needs and find solutions that maximize your return on investment. Their customer service is top-notch. And satisfaction is their war cry. So, small to medium business owners, if you want to negotiate and communicate like a pro, reach out to Global Tech Worldwide. Visit their website, global-tech.com. Again, global-tech.com. Or, of course, give them a call. They're battle ready to consult, provide, and support every step of the way. Make the strategic choice with Global Tech worldwide. Awesome, Dave. I'm ready to go to battle. <laughs> that was awesome. And before we get back to Dr. Mike Perko, aka Mike, Big Mike, uh, well, let's give some big props to a couple of folks that have been just instrumental to us in the last few months. Dave, <clears throat> um, you want to give big props to somebody? 
Absolutely. Listen, big props to Braden Dixon. Braden Yay. Dixon, formerly of, of ScanSource, uh, moving on to new opportunities with an IT consulting firm called SADA. Listen, Braden, we've learned a lot from you. You have a bright future ahead of your, uh, you have a bright future ahead of you. And SADA, I'll tell you, they are very fortunate to have recruited you. So best of luck with your new venture with SADA. Uh, and of course, listen, big props to Liz York. Liz York, yes. you have been a partner of ours for quite a while. You've known yes, our Liz. business. Um, you have some shoes to fill backing up. Braden, thank you. Thank you for your support. And we look forward to working with you again. And thank you, Liz, for your feedback. We had a chance to talk actually earlier today before we started recording. So thank you. Appreciate the wonderful feedback. You know what I'm talking about. So thanks again for um, the, the wonderful feedback. So let's get back to Mike. We're talking about the little ones being the future and also uh, working with uh, within the workplace, you know, the professionals that are there like you and I working in the workplace. And I want you to take a look at this clip because it gets to what we're talking about and then we'll discuss it on the other side of the clip. Go ahead and roll that, Ori. Mandating its workers return to the office. Return to the office. To return to the office. Return to office. Back into the office. Back to the office. Even Zoom, the company this is, now throwing in the towel on fully remote work. The company that cashed in on the digital work revolution is now requiring most employees to work in person. In person. We now know what the percentage is. It's just under 40 percent are never coming back to the office. Wow. I wanted to ask you about this because we, it seems like we're at an inflection point and the whole trajectory of work is going in a different direction, at least for a good chunk of those work professionals today that are out there doing uh, from the, in the keyboard economy, borrowing somebody else's phrase. How do you see this playing out? Well, so it's interesting. Um, uh, I've been in worksite well-being, worksite wellness for 30 years. Uh, I have worked mostly with companies that have remote sites. But those remote sites have uh, live human beings inside those buildings, whether it's mm -hmm. two people at a substation in Eight Mile, Alabama, or the corporate headquarters in Birmingham when we were working with their, um, with their program there. Um, but here's the thing, and I hope you're sitting down, because I also have live human beings who are in my classroom. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what happened. Obviously, during COVID, everybody went online, and, and we did that for a number of years. In fact. Um, UNCG and our Department of Public Health actually went against the grain. Our, so this is important. Our chancellor said, you know, everybody's back face to face because we wanted to have a show of good faith. We're taking all the precautions. But as epidemiologists, we said, well, it's not over. There, there's going to be there's going to be an upswing when it gets cold. And we actually went against the grain and said, you know, don't come back to class. Uh, we had a slap mm -hmm. on the wrist, but we actually minimized the infection rates. And many of our students are, are uh, black and brown so that they have higher risk. So we actually thought of the employees or our students first and kept them safe. Now, here's okay, the Hold on a second. Before you go on, yeah. that deserves a clap because it is a very difficult thing to go against the grain and stand up for what's right. And that deserves recognition. Well, um, so we know our students. We know their personal lives. We, we know that some of them struggle. Uh, with, you know, having access to health care. Uh, we did not want to put them and their families at risk. Uh, morally and ethically, we couldn't do it. Now, a business decision was made to have students come back to the classroom uh, because that makes good press. However, as epidemiologists, we, we couldn't fly with that. So, uh, it, again, we got slapped on the wrist, but, you know, better to ask for uh, forgiveness than permission. Our, our students felt much more connected to us because we, put, we showed grace and we kept them healthy. But what has happened is now that we are fully back face to face, I will tell you this. Um, I typically teach classes 48 to 50 students um, in, in the past. You know, I would have 45 students show up. Uh, but what's happening now is uh, if I have 20 students show up, um, that's a good day. And I would ask the students who would be face to face, so our, our in-person workers, mm -hmm. what's going on? And they said, well, students simply uh, began college online, went to their first two years online. Mm. They really don't know how to navigate that face-to-face -face experience. Interesting. And we expected them to jump right back into a face-to-face -face when they really hadn't had no orientation on campus. 
Uh, so not, not to say that, you know, they didn't go to school face to face when they were younger, but that's the struggle that we're dealing with right now. And would you say that given that, um, and the, really that's an eye opening piece of information that since, um, those, those two classes that went, uh, those, those freshman and sophomore classes that, yeah. that went through that, that, that cycle, you know, they've built some new muscle memory around virtual work about, about virtual learning that they probably wouldn't have gained. And it sounds like from what you're saying, some of those students also prefer it that way. Cause otherwise they just walk back into the classroom. Well, they, they really do. And, you know, uh, as I, as I call my students, scholars and colleagues, we, we want to have a mutual respect. But it is easier to do this from your bedroom and turn the camera off. So unless I have policies such as, you know, camera must always be on, um, you must participate in class somehow, whether it's a chat or something. Uh, we as professors are also learning how to navigate um, a respectful environment, uh, but also you know, get, get our message across, which is trying to prepare them for it, for the working world. So uh, Dave and Rolando, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of walking through this as well as they are having to navigate these human relationships. Mm -hmm. As you're, as you're helping the youth prepare for the future of work or preparing them to join the workforce, has their perception changed about work and careers since the pandemic. So a lot of these folks may have fo may have parents that were working from home. They were keyboard. The, the, what, did, what, what do we call it, Rolando? The, the keyboard economy. The keyboard economy. So I, I understand that not everyone has the privilege of working on a keyboard. But for those that did, and the children that saw this, they saw a parent or parents at home working. Do you feel that it's changed the perception of their idea of career and work as they get older and join the workforce? So that's a great question, Dave. Uh, uh, you know, obviously you've had so many guests on that have explained maybe the generational um, folks that who who are in the workplace. So for the for the for the Gen Zs, they've got a couple things going on now. These are the traditional students in a classroom. So you know, 18, 19 years old to about 24, 25. Um, they've gone through a number of things, all right? They've gone through COVID. Uh, they go through, uh, they've all gone through active shooter training in schools. And their parents who are uh, millennials or Gen Xers are a little more protective of them. So they're coming from a, a let's call it a, a mental health uh, situation where they don't make uh, necessary decisions based on past experience. They really rely on more of a support group, and they they tend to get online right away. Now they will have keyboards, believe me. Uh, they set up anywhere. They can, uh, you know, they're a tra they're a traveling classroom. They can set up anywhere, take classes, uh, do all those types of things. So to them, that's as normal as pumpkin pie. To any generation before them, that was something they had to learn. And of course, the next generation coming in will never have not known a keyboard or something in their hand, right? So uh, all that to say, I don't have, I just don't have the answers. And, and maybe you're talking to CEOs that might still be straddling the 20th century where what we do is we work and where we work is from the offices. And so there's going to have to be a, a, a tightrope walked between future CEOs and students who may not choose to work for a company where these these demands go against uh, the behaviors that they've learned. Well, I don't think you're saying anything different than Kevin O'Leary, who said, you know, 40% of his workers, he did a survey and they like he said on that clip, they will never come back. I mean, he put a lot of emphasis on that. And we had on Steve Cadigan a, a couple of weeks ago and, and shared that piece of clip with, with him. And he says, you know, he's come to a realization because he didn't start off that way when, when, when things started um, going remote, he was very much, we're going to get back to the office as soon as we open back into the office. And then he's had an evolution because he's found out he's looked at the data and it made sense that his workers are going to leave uh, and that the labor market is tight and that it's more profitable for them to um, expand the remote work uh, policies there. 
So I think this this going to we're going to be several years in the making here between employees that want to work from home, employers trying to figure it out, and then the real fact that real estate in a lot of big cities and metros area are empty, and and there's something's got to be done. You can we could leave them empty, or we could do something about it. And I think the day will come when um, more and more policies are geared around hybrid work or some form of work because. We are not in the 1940s where the idea of going to an office was adopted, nine to five was adopted, driving from the suburbs to, um, to into the uh, city center was adopted, and that was the norm. And I think we're going to be setting the new course for the next 40 or 50 years with, with what's happened in the last couple of years. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree at all. And and as a matter of fact, when you think about it, universities are having to reinvent themselves as well. We know what we're competing against. If we say we're an only on or a, a, a only a face to face program, you know what? We're going to lose some students because it it does fit their life, and people's lives are busy. Let's face it, people. You know, their to do list looks like this: get up, survive, go back to bed. So the last thing you want to deal with is, is, is a parking spot that you can't find and you're already running late for class. So there's a whole lot of other reasons why students are looking for a, a more convenient way to get their education. And if their future employees are saying, well, that was great. I'm glad you've got that online degree. Now you've got to drive to our parking deck and park and fight traffic. That's going to be incongruent with the whole thing they've done. So as a professor, and I will just very quickly say this, we're being asked. I mean, literally, it, meetings have like a big pep rally to say, how can we recruit and retain students so that we can make the experience as valuable for them, right? Because in the past, you just went to college. Right. But it's, it's, we're, we're literally reinventing ourselves. My goodness. I, I mean, I just, I just put myself in those shoes when I went to college, which seems like 100 years ago. It was. And you know, there, there was no Zoom and none of this stuff. And yeah. um, having the, these tools available to you, you know, the, we're, everything changes every, every couple of years and, and technology and events change all of that. And so, you know, we're, horse and buggy was around for a while. The car came around and changed all of that. I'm sure a lot of people were grumbling about cars and roads and, you know, making bridges and all the rest. But eventually everybody came around to the automobile. Uh, there are articles talking about radio being, you know, the, the, the bane of the, of, of the earth and the stain and all this and all that. Same with the internet. We're in that next revolution, I think, where both education, workplace, and other ways we do things uh, are about to change. And with that, I want to tap into some secrets. You know, I know you're coming on the show with three secrets, and we're going to go into that right now. So, Ori, go ahead and roll the top three secrets intro. Well kept secrets, well kept secrets, gotta keep them safe and sound well. But secret secrets are just like, just like, like diamonds. All right, Mike. One of the secrets that you said to me was uh, when we're, we're talking about whether it's the workplace environment or what you want to do with your initiative is... Keep it simple. What does that mean? So, uh, you know, you guys asked me, uh, how did I want to be uh, referred to today? Is it, is it Dr. Mike, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I just want to be called by my name, which is Mike. It's the simplest thing you can do. Also, it's the most human thing. It's how we make connections. We call each other uh, by our names. Um, you know, there's, there's also respect in that title. But, you know, we want to keep it simple. So I've been doing worksite wellness, worksite well-being for 30 years. And I can tell you, I've seen the evolution of how we get people to, I'm going to use the word participate, but it's a 20th century word, right? We used to, you know, go around and people had to sign up and then they had to show up um, and then they had to get online and set a password. And it was different from their portal. And what would happen is it was just one click too many and people would not participate in the wellness offerings that we had and we we learned one thing pretty quickly we do wellness with people not to people right 
Mm -hmm. So we're not on high preaching, you know, you should walk more, you should watch what you're putting in your mouth, get more sleep, et cetera. We, we, we've learned that that does not work. Well, what does work? Keeping it as simple as possible. So we don't really necessarily want to call people participants. We want to create an environment that's so engaging that the minute people step inside that culture, it's, it's exactly what they thought it was. Everything they do is leading towards either their better uh, mental health, emotional health, physical health, social health, et cetera. So the, the number one rule or secret that we want to do when we want, so again, I'm coming here as a public health professor, but also I have this initiative with kids, which I think is going to be world changing. And it's all about keeping it simple and I'm going to sort of throw back to you guys something you did. I noticed that you showed gratitude to a couple of people. Acknowledgement and gratitude is one of the key simple steps when, when, we, when we do say keep it simple. Um, that's going to get people to come on board because everybody wants to be acknowledged. So, man, that's the recipe. Keep it simple and acknowledge people. That's secret number one. Okay. Shall we and, go to secret number two? Or do you absolutely. Want to no, and you touched on secret number two a little bit, which was moving from engagement to participation. Instead of giving out ribbons for part, uh, for for participation, which I think is, uh, there's about a million memes out there, right? Tenth place <laughs> ribbon for, for showing up to actually getting that person who came in tenth place engaged in the process. So talk about yeah. that. Sure. Uh, so again, um, you know, 20 years ago, let's say we, we'd have a, a, a big kickoff for, let's say, a, a 5K run that we were doing at a, at a work site. And so what would happen is, is uh, you would get people, uh, they would get a free hour off from work and they'd, we'd say, come participate in this kickoff. And they would come and they'd, they'd get free food. And then you would go to see who signed up and nobody actually signed up. They got the hour off. They participated, but there was no effect right? People didn't actually sign up. And we found out that people who were, quote unquote, participating, participating in worksite wellness were doing it for all the other reasons that we had planned. That is to improve, you know, um, uh, improve their blood pressure, improve their cholesterol, et cetera. So we moved away from counting people who showed up in a room and asked them, right? We do wellness with people, not to people. We asked them, how would, how would it be if you were to be engaged and they would tell us, I want to do it on my own time. I want to do it at home with my dog or my husband or my spouse or my partner or my kid. And so we would create things for them. So we moved away from counting people, right? Oh, there were 60 people in the room. We had a big success. No, you had a big lunch bill because we fed all those 60 people <laughs> and we never saw them again. So that's participation. We have moved into asking people, what would it take for you to be engaged? Let them tell us, and then we facilitate that. So get away from expecting people to come in, uh, whether you know physically or mentally, uh, to be a part of your program and ask them what they want. We found that that ownership uh, involves people coming in a lot more. Nice. I love that. That's, that's, that's it's amazing. Uh, more than just showing up and, and being a body um, and actually being a really involved in the process. It's just, just amazing. And so the number three, go ahead and put that back up, Ori. The third one, which is think long-term. And this gets into where you and I were talking about also uh, your initiative as well. What's that all about thinking long-term? What do you yeah, mean? Yeah, man, I'm, I'm, literally, I'm literally ready to jump out of my seat because this is, this is so much a, 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 a part of my, of my being today. So, um, I'm going to tell you very good. First of all, I'm going to tell you a couple stories. So cut me off. Sure, no, go ahead. Way. Fire but away with the stories. All, uh, the, the, the best way to talk about long-term is to tell you the legend of Larry Walters. Are you guys familiar with the legend of Larry Walters at all? I'm not. not. All right. So uh, Larry Walters was a, was a real live human being that uh, had grown up always wanting to fly. Uh, he wanted to be a pilot, but unfortunately his eyesight was not that good. So he never achieved that dream but it didn't stop him from achieving flight. So Larry Walters wanted to surprise his girlfriend. This was in the 1970s. He wanted to surprise his girlfriend. Um, and so what he did, he said, well, I'm going to uh, surprise her, but also achieve my goal of flight. He went to a Army Navy store and bought a number of weather balloons. 
Okay. Now you may, uh, this may become familiar. And he took about 45 weather balloons and attached them, filled them up with helium, attached them to a lawn chair that he had in his garage. <laughs> and to add ballast or weight, he put some sandbags on that lawn chair. Now, here was the plan. Larry, when his girlfriend was going to be coming home that night, um, had some friends and they were going to cut the wires that he had holding him to the earth. And he was going to float lazily over her car and sing her happy birthday. And it was very romantic. <laughs> Excellent. Hopefully it wasn't too windy. Well, get ready for this. So his friends cut the lines holding him to the planet. And instead of lazily floating 30 feet above her car, he quickly rose to 10,000 feet. Oh. Okay. So now Larry is floating with the golf stream. <laughs> <laughs> and he stayed up there for over 10 hours okay oh my. now he did have a safety plan he had a pellet gun that when he went to shoot the first balloon he <laughs> dropped it so now he is at the mercy of mother nature now what happened during the 10-hour flight at 10,000 feet is he diverted not one but two commercial aircraft like literally they had to go we have we have a man-made craft couldn't we have to be diverted so that <laughs> happened he, he was able to pull some balloons down let the air out and as he floated back to earth after after uh 10 10 uh, hours and 45 miles that he had traveled across california he got caught in some power lines and caused a major blackout in oh my country. god and he didn't fry himself no he did not but when he landed he was promptly arrested for a federal offenses uh, di diverting aircraft etc well Here's the moral of the story, and I tell this to companies who are very excited about doing things, whether it's to get people healthier or to enact new policies, is don't let your programs become Larry Walter, right? It seemed like a good idea at the time. However, once it got going, nobody knew where we were headed or where we would end up, mm -hmm. right? So that goes into secret number three. You have to plan for the long term. Where are you headed and how are you going to get there? Wellness is a great idea. We all want to help. I've never met a CEO that didn't want people to, to their employees to be healthier, but you got to know where you're headed and where you're going to end up. So, you know, making sure that you're measuring and evaluating these programs is, is the critical third secret that I would tell people. Interesting. Wow. Love that story about Larry. Uh, boy, I know if that was me, I would be scared. You know what? Like, hopefully I'm, I'm strapped in real nice and tight on around this chair because uh, 10,000 feet <laughs> is not like even 50 feet, like jumping off a roof or a building like that. Can you imagine? But, oh, but you're so, so right. Having, having a way to measure that um, so that, you know, when you get there, what the outcomes produced and, and knowing what those best practices should be. No, that's, that's amazing. Amazing. And so there was something, I think we said at the beginning when we we're talking about, um, the future of work and, and kids, I'm reminded of a song when we're talking about, and I was talking about with the guys before, you know, the, we are the world. There's a verse, um, in there. And the verse says, we are the world. We are the children. It's true. We'll make a better day, just you and me. And that reminded me so much of what you're doing with this initiative of 500 fist bumps. Yeah, because as so. you told me this story, when we, when we, you and I last chatted, I was like, not only is it inspirational, not only is it simple with what you, you just mentioned, one of those secrets, but it's effective, tangible. And as the last thing you just said, it can be measured. The difference can be measured and its impact as well. So Let's jump right into that and, and go ahead. You have the floor yeah, so on that. Tell me, every, tell our audience all about it. I can't wait. Everybody, everybody, hopefully in their life has that bolt of lightning, right? That tells them their why, their, their purpose on life. I had it later in life and I'd already had a career. So let's, let's just be sure, Dave, I know you said you did a little uh, search for me, but you may not have known that prior to my 27 years as a uh, professor, for 10 years, I was a high school and college coach. I coached uh, lacrosse, mm -hmm. I coached ice hockey, and I coached soccer. I was a college soccer player, grew up 
playing uh, youth sports, et cetera. And so it never occurred to me that I would have the opportunity to take my former life as a coach and meld it with my current life as a professor who studies the behaviors of adults. Now, so what happened to me was a personal story, but it, it was the proverbial bolt of lightning. So I'll, I'll, I'll be quick here. So um, I have kids. I, I have a, a son, Jack, and I have a daughter, Elena. And as they were growing up, they, they played youth sports. I mean, most parents in the world see participation in youth sports as a social good, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, you'll have fun. You'll make friends. And there's actually tons of research to show that kids who go through a rec sport experience do better in school. Um, they're less likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. Um, they're more likely to develop leadership skills, et cetera. So it's all good. And most parents will get their kids involved. So my son, Jack, when he was 10, had played a number of sports and I found a lacrosse camp locally. And I asked him, I said, Jack, you want to try a lacrosse camp? And he's like, absolutely. It'd be great. And then he said, but will I be the only beginner at this lacrosse camp? And I, well, I don't know. Let me call the director. And I called him and the director said, Jack will not be the only beginner. We have tons of interest. So he is, he is going to be in good company. So we drive to that camp. Jack was not in good company. Jack was the only beginner there. Not only was he only the, the only beginner, but he was the youngest kid by three and four years, shortest kid by a foot, and the only kid with a clean jersey, man. Everybody else had played before. They had club names, and Jack is standing there with a little lacrosse stick, and he wanted to be anywhere but. So I said, you know, we've got to do this. So he walks on the field, and Dave – and Rolando and the rest of your audience, what happened in the next 10 seconds when the coach pulled everybody together changed Jack's lacrosse experience, but it changed my life. So the coach for the day grabbed all these kids together who all knew each other except Jack. And he goes, okay, guys, we're going to be together every day for the next five days for an hour each day. And here's how it's going to go. We're going to go through lacrosse drills, but every time you make a good pass or score a goal or pick up a ground ball, you're going to get a fist bump from somebody. But every time you miss a pass, miss the net, or don't do so well, you're still going to get a fist bump because the goal of this camp is not only to make you a better lacrosse player, but it's to build a team. And we want to make sure that we all have each other's back. And then he said, how many fist bumps do you think we can get in an hour? And one kid pipes up and says, 500 which is a lot. And the coach said, let's go, boys. 500 fist bumps in the next hour. And I watched my son, who wanted to be anywhere but, start getting fist bumps left and right. The gratitude aspect, the acknowledgement of his existence. And not only that, he's giving fist bumps back to these kids who were 6'4", 6'6". And that hour was amazing. On the way home, we get in the truck, and he just about passes out in the back seat from exhaustion. And I'm like, Jack, how was that? He goes, just before he closes his eyes, best day ever. Hmm. Here's the moral of the story. It took this coach no more than 10 seconds to create a culture. Are you ready? Keep it simple. That was it. 10 seconds. Everybody was swimming in the same direction. Jack felt engaged, not just participating. And then the bolt of lightning hit me. Why can't we legislate a 10-second script on every youth sport program across the world where it takes only that long to create a community? Because here's what happens in the long term. 10 years from now, when a kid goes through what we call the 500 fist bump experience, right, which is we try to get 500 fist bumps at every youth or recreation activity, that, and I'm going to talk about what happens to our brain. When we have this physical touch, ten mm-hmm. years from now, when when the future jacks of the world are our teachers, are our parents, are the coaches on the field, um, police officers, firefighters, etc., we feel pretty confident that they will now have a greater sense of empathy, encouragement, support, respect, and love for their fellow human being. That's a good thing. So that is my life for the for until I until I leave this planet. Mike, have you have you followed up with that coach and? kind of giving him your feedback and how he's inspiring the team, but it, it's inspi- it inspired a dad at the same time. Did you, yeah. did you speak to him? Dave, here's the amazing thing. 
so uh, that the idea didn't hit me right away. So that coach left after a week, after a week. But here's the thing. That coach went and inspired other kids with that speech. My 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 big I wouldn't say a problem is that if we're lucky, we had that coach in our life. My goal was to legislate every kid, every kid who steps on ice court field or pool gets that coach. I waited for years when Jack played other sports if that magic would happen again, and I never saw it. So it was it was a couple of years later that I had the idea that every kid should be part of a 500 fist bump. But but I, I don't even know his name. But I, I hope that someday he sees this and remembers the littlest kid at his camp and says that was me because I will I will make him chairman of the board, man. Because it, <laughs> it yeah, it's such a wonderful story, and I think um, and you also mentioned that. Um, it does change the brain itself. I don't want to let that slip because this is a great story. And some people will say, that's good, Mike, but that doesn't work. You know, that's just another name for ribbons, right? You're just making them feel good. Tell me about what you know about the research behind that. Yeah. So, you know, here's the power of the fist bump. Everybody knows what a fist bump is, sort of a universal symbol, right? Well, if you think about it, it is skin to skin. And we have a massive field of study in neurobiology of what a tactile gesture does for us. So let's be clear. After five fist bumps, our brain begins to produce a chemical called oxytocin, which is, which is the brain's pleasure chemical. So just by stepping on the field and getting five fist bumps within a couple of minutes, you're already creating an experience for you that's, that's, that's a good experience, right? I, I feel good here. After 50 fist bumps, we have now reduced the levels of, of cortisol, right, which is the stress hormone in our body. After 150 fist bumps, are you ready? We're now lowering our blood pressure and anxiety levels. Now, this research has been go going on for five decades, right? After mm. 300 fist bumps, we have now created an environment for us to feel safe and, and in a trusted space. And here's where the magic happens. After 500 fist bumps, the insular cortex, which is a, a part of the brain that's really hidden low into the folds um, in our brain, that creates really a recipe for us to feel uh, safe, trusted. Um, we literally feel like we have created a sense of community. The, the insular cortex is part of the brain that, that, that um, we feel believes uh, uh, is part of our consciousness. Okay. So we are consciously in a place that we feel like we can't wait to get on that soccer field because we know it might be the only environment that we're in where we feel safe, secure, and part of the group. Does it have besides the neurobiology that you explained so eloquently, does it or could it have any performance benefits as well? So, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, for those uh, naysayers that come to me and say, oh, Mike, you know, 500 fist bumps, yay, that's a participation trophy. I will refer them to a study that was done out of Cal Berkeley that took 234 NBA players, right, all levels, the highest paid down to the rookies. And what they did is they encouraged these players to high five as many people as they could during their practices. And in fact, encouraged the teams to adopt that behavior across all 234 players. It didn't matter uh, their, their salary or years in the league. They all performed better. We know wow. that if we can create a team based on trust, acknowledgement, gratitude, and you know, when you get scored upon as the goalie, everybody runs up, fist bumps you and says, man, we're still in this. That's going to create a team that does better performance wise than just the opposite of the coach who screams at you and yells at you and, you know, makes it a negative experience, especially for kids. That is amazing. That is just fascinating. We could spend another hour just talking about the research, the data yeah. and yeah. how uh, what it what it means to youth sports, what it means to the workplace as well. Imagine in the workplace if, you know, it's not quite a sports environment. It's not a soccer team. It's not a football team. But the team concept 
I think is being redefined as well by virtual work. And there may be some form of this, I'm sure that can be brought into the workplace to create, you know, more unity, better performance, um, a, sa a safe space, you know, because a lot of people do not feel safe at work uh, for well, a number of reasons. So I know we have a short time, but I need, I want to get this point again. And I sure, want to thank you and Dave. It. I want to thank you and Dave for, for uh, giving me this, this, this platform. We know that kids have been through it. Okay. We know that kids are stressed. They're anxious, et cetera. What, what my goal in life is every coach who welcomes a kid into the pool on the court, the rink, or wherever they play doesn't just see a speedy left wing or, or a kid with a strong right foot. I need them to know that if they have 20 kids on their team, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Right. Two don't know where they're going to eat their next hot meal. Hmm. Four live in either an abusive or broken home. Five do not have English as their primary first language. So everything else takes a little more time, is a little more difficult. Six are being bullied in some form or fashion. Eight have been diagnosed with uh, depression, anxiety, some sort of uh, PTSD or some sort of mental condition. All 20 have been through active shooter training since pre-K. The reason I make this point, and I, I appreciate you allowing me to make it, is, sure. again, what are we doing for these kids? There's nothing there there. We have an epidemic of mental health for kids. We don't go to the coaches and say, hey, maybe you want to do this. I'm going to the CEOs and saying, you need to put in 500 fist bumps. It's imperative that you commit to doing this to the future members of your community. That's, that's my goal. Uh, I, 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 let me, I applaud that. And I hope more people that hear this message can share that, forward that on to their legislatures, their coach, their high school, their college, their workplace, so that the more people are out there doing it, it just becomes part of, and there you go, 500, yeah, we got a, a good shot here of you doing some of that. Uh, yeah, where can you. people go if they want more information, Mike? So uh, 500fistbumps.org. Uh, we are affiliated with the Center for Athlete Wellbeing here at UNCG, which is a nonprofit center that studies all aspects of the well-being of athletes. From little kids, Rolando, I know you have a wonderful four-year-old, right, who's going <laughs> to be involved. Wouldn't you like them to be a part of a 500 fist bump uh, experience where every time, whether it's soccer or football or hockey or, or swimming, they know that the community they join will be uh, a 500 fist bump community. Absolutely. Dave, I don't know about you if you've got kids. But man, this is the, this is the future. Respect, man. That's great. He's got, he's got, he's got, he's got, he knows. <laughs> so we've been talking to Dr. Mike Perko, uh, a, a very important conversation it's about the future working about those future workers that will be uh, our leaders at some point. And if you enjoyed this episode and you want more data and stories about remote working, and you'll want to check out that last episode that we did regarding the state of remote work, where we give you some data, evidence, and statistics, including the data found by Fujitsu of 80,000 employees and what it was like after they sent everybody home. So you'll want to go check out those episodes. You can listen or watch at circuitloops.com or wherever you consume your podcasts. So I want to thank Dr. Mike Perko for coming on the show today, and we will see you next time. Air fist bump. And a fist bump. There you go. Now, for those that are watching us on YouTube, I want to invite you to go to this episode that I've got on the screen right now. Dave and I will see you in those episodes. See you next time.